How well do we know Dolly Madison and Jacqueline Kennedy? Household names, but larger than life archetypes. The early 19th century and mid-century first lady shaped their vicarious office for years and years to come. They're in the pantheon, known for glamour and fashion, but there was much more to them than that. Um, but we, they never told us that in history class, right? <laughs> so here we are to turn over some history stones. Thank you for being here today. Dolly and Jackie did not have power, of course, but they had influence. And both were very savvy about using it. In discussing them, I'll give a biographical sketch and focus on their eventful White House years. Mrs. Kennedy was first lady for a thousand days, Mrs. Madison for eight years, from 1809 to 1817. Starting with Dolly Payne Todd Madison, she was born a Quaker in 1768, in colonial days. She grew up in Virginia. Her father emancipated their family slave. Because, as we know, the Quakers, or friends, were in the forefront of opposing slavery. But they were the first religion to oppose slavery. So family fortunes started to suffer, and her father died in Philadelphia, where the family had moved. Young Dolly married her first husband, a Quaker lawyer named John Todd, in the Pine Street Meeting House. Anybody in Philadelphia? Um, this is where Lucretia Mott and her husband James were wed. The Todds had a son, aptly named Payne. He was a pain his entire life. <laughs> <laughs> the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 hit Philadelphia hard. They took, took thousands of casualties and deaths. And John Todd was one of them. Dolly fell back on her mother, a widow, who had opened a boarding house for members of Congress because Philadelphia was the working capital in the 1790s. A sleek, handsome senator was staying at the boarding house. He was known for wooing ladies with his velvet voice. <laughs> No, I don't mean James Madison. Oh. No. I mean Aaron Burr. Oh. <laughs> he was pretty dreamy, but Dolly was not his cup of tea. Instead, he did a mitzvah. You know what a mitzvah is? A good deed? For his shy Princeton classmate, Jenny Madison. He knew that Dolly needed a husband, and he knew Jemmy, a bachelor at 40, had trouble getting a date. <laughs> so he told Jimmy to come for dinner. A young lady wants to meet you. And he told Dolly, a congressman, a planter would like to meet you. The match worked like a charm. They were engaged within weeks. <laughs> now the Society of Friends, the Quakers, actually disowned Dolly. Why? For marrying James, not because she married out of her faith, but because James was a lar large slave master. The nice name for that was Planter. But he had a plantation in Virginia called Montpelier. You may be familiar with that. <clears throat> His family home was a plantation with 100 enslaved people. It was within riding distance of Thomas Jefferson, Monticello. He was great friends with the sage of Monticello. The truth is, Dolly didn't miss wearing plain Quaker gray, and all that went with it. She liked the luxuries of a Virginia lady much more. In fact, she looked back on the friends as keeping her from so many advantages and pleasures. She never expressed moral reservations about owning slaves or servants as they say, in the country, nor in the White House. The Madisons brought some enslaved people with them to work in the White House. 
and one was the devoted Paul Jennings. Remember that name. As you may have discerned, Dolly was by nature a plucky survivor. A woman her age with an infant could hardly hope to make ends meet. So her best option was marrying well. Bookish James was never the life of the party, but that became her job after their marriage. Dolly became the life of the party in Washington during the early Republic period. Dolly, in a way, invented her place in history as the first first lady. She invented the office with her talents for throwing mixers and weekly Wednesday soirees, making people feel part of the new capital's social swim. Her head turbans and bright col colored, daringly cut clothes stood out in crowds, perhaps as a way of making up for her Quaker girlhood. Mrs. Madison remembered names like nobody else, and she invited droves of people into the president's house, defining American hospitality as informal and inclusive. Compared to the formal royal palaces of Europe, the young democracy leading lady made people feel at home with the southern accent and enthusiasm for an entertaining. She was a raging extrovert. And James was an introvert who well knew his wife reached out to others in a way that he never could. Dolly's gifts were not diplomacy or statecraft, but a kind of nation building. Mrs. Madison formed the core of the American social character and turned the lights on here in the city, which was known for its magnificent distances. Ambassadors considered Washington a hardship post at that time. Washington was still rough and in the making, and she made the living easier. Remember, the Washingtons never lived in the White House. During the four Adams years, the place was still under construction. Mm -hmm. Jefferson was a widower, President Jefferson. So, so was his vice president, Aaron Burr. Dashing Aaron Burr. <laughs> <laughs> so Dolly stepped in to act as hostess for President Jefferson from time to time. And she actively sought to link her husband to Jefferson his best friend. But Dolly was in it for posterity, too, not just the moment. And here we come to a side of her character that can only be called opportunistic. Dolly, on a visit to Monticello, cornered Sally Hemings, who was pregnant. And here is where I'm going to be Dolly for a moment, all right? Prepare yourself. <laughs> If the child's a boy, will you name him after Mr. Madison? If you do, I'll give you a present. <laughs> That's how I imagine the scene. <laughs> this is how the baby boy was named James Madison Hemings. In 1805, Jefferson's fatherhood of the Hemings children was no secret to visitors and friends in Virginia circles. One son bore striking, striking resemblance to Jefferson and also played the fiddle. In an Ohio newspaper, Madison Hemings, the son, later wrote that, quote, like the promises of most white folks, there was no present from Dolly. Madison succeeded Jefferson as a hand-picked president. Dolly was first lady for most of her 40s. The Virginia dynasty was underway, for James Monroe would succeed Madison. That's 24 years of Virginia rule, from 1800 to 1824. Something shattering and terrible happened to the Madison presidency in his second term. The British were coming. They were really coming. They were 
they were right at the White House. They went to the Capitol, and they burned down the Capitol's buildings. They sacked Washington. Madison never served in the military, and in fright, he, felt he fled the city on horseback to Virginia. Washington was utterly undefended. At the White House, the table was set for 40 people, 40 dinners, but Dolly got word she should take for the hills, this part of Georgetown. What? <laughs> she made for Georgetown. Everybody knows the story of her saving the Gilbert Stuart portrait of George Washington, right? Actually, it was the enslaved Paul Jennings <laughs> really? who saved, yes, who saved the treasured painting. But Dolly owned the narrative, and she made that story travel through time and distance to become an American myth. That's the first thing people associate with her name. The British generals and soldiers enjoyed the dinner feast at the White House before setting it on fire. Okay, I'm going to trade you just because this one's okay. acting funny. Okay. And if it does act funny again, it's what you have. So back to the White House. Meanwhile, um, the, the British generals and soldiers enjoyed, enjoyed the dinner feast at the White House before setting it on fire. This is late summer of 1814. It's part of the War of 1812. But that is not what's remembered. President Mad Madison's humiliation in the face of the British Army was saved, in a way, by the clever counterpoint that his wife created. Dolly deflected away from James's defeat by weaving a story of her triumph and spirit in salvaging a national symbol. She was much more of a politician than he was. James was, of course, the main framer of the Constitution. Um, he was very shy and slight, probably 5'4". And um, I found a vignette about their home life in Virginia that humanizes them in a surprising way. Dolly was taller and she weighed more than James. So sometimes she would take him on her back and get in the room. <laughs> Very playful, right? <laughs> James died before Dolly, of course, but did not free any slaves in his will. There was some thought that he wished Dolly to do so at the end of her life, in her will, but that did not happen. She sold some enslaved people, including her personal maid, Suki, and died at 81 in pinched fi financial straits. She was still seen as the grand dame of Washington. Now we come to the young Mrs. Kennedy, who was a dark-haired beauty and a fresh rose after dowdy Mamie Eisenhower. Um, Jack Kennedy was 43 and possibly youthful, next to the outgoing general and President Ike, who was born in 1890, <laughs> and at age 70 when he left leadership to the new generation. President Kennedy was inaugurated on a bright snowy day in January 1961, elected 62 years ago, right? Yeah. So more or less. A new decade beckoned to the whole nation. I'm sure you remember that, right? Yeah? The Kennedy inauguration? Jackie Kennedy was even younger than her husband. She was only 31 when she took office. Her eye for the perfect dress or hat will always be remembered in the annals of fashion. Indeed, she created the classic look of the early 60s. Elegant, clear, and simple lines in breathtaking color statements. If that's all we know, that's not enough. People who remember the Kennedy White House say a cultural celebration happened on her watch. 
It was no ordinary first lady who invited cellist Pablo Casals to perform one evening before delighted guests. It was no ordinary first lady who planned a surprise event of Renaissance poetry and music for her husband, the president. It was no ordinary first lady who put on a shimmering evening to honor American Nobel Prize winners in the arts and sciences. It was no ordinary first lady who gave five dinner dances with spring flowers in the thousand days, along with candlelit state dinners. After the drab 50s, when Eisenhower's only extracurricular activity was passion was golf, and Mamie watched soap operas, the Kennedys were not just about glamour. Some of their best friends were, were movie stars, but looks can be deceiving. They were about excellence, too, and class in the best sense of the word. Nothing but the best. Robert Frost read a poem aloud on the first, in the first inauguration, the only inauguration. Um, this was a signal. Robert Frost reading the poem was a signal to the nation that the White House would welcome poets, artists, musicians, as well as power brokers. And a new era broke like, a new era broke like dawn that day. It was a freezing winter day. Journalists still talk about it, <laughs> about what, the, how glorious it was. Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders visited after the March on Washington in 1963, a few months before Kennedy's death. The Kennedy White House was also inclusive. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy grew up as a society girl in New York, a debutante who went to Miss Porter's and on to Vassar. She rode horses at a gallop, and her wit was just as quick. Her, she and her younger sister, Lee, spent a summer gallivant gallivanting around Europe. Yes, she re represented the height of old money at her grand wedding to a Massachusetts senator held in Newport. But she didn't seem spoiled by privilege. In her 20s, she held a newspaper photographer job where she asked strangers on the street pert questions of her own design. Fixed up with Jack at a Georgetown dinner party, so we have another match making at play. <clears throat> she married the man 12 years older at about the same age as Dolly was when she married James. Arthur, Arthur Schlesinger, a Kennedy speechwriter and confidant, said the White House years were their happiest together. Her husband's delight in her was visible. His eyes brightened when he talked of her or when she unexpectedly dropped by the office. Like Madison, he came to appreciate her talents as a political asset. Jack realized she was reinventing her own office. In 1962, Mrs. Kennedy went public and opened the doors of the White House to bring the multitudes in, again in the same spirit as Mrs. Madison. CBS News broadcast a documentary of her hosting a walk through the White House, showing her love of its architecture and history in a breathy voice that defies description. Here is the Monroe candel candelabra. There is the John Adams blessing over the fireplace. This is Franklin Roosevelt's uh, favorite room and on and on. Her ambitious White House restoration became her signature project with a simple declaration. Everything in the White House must have a reason for being there. That, that is a question of scholarship. At a relatively young age, Mrs. Kennedy played to her own strengths and could have been accused of being elitist. Certainly, some rough-and-tumble Kennedy family found her sophistication a bit much at first because she didn't play touch football with them. 
<laughs> at Hyannisport. But she was Catholic, mom and dad. <laughs> Joe, the family patriarch, held her high in his schemes and dreams for Jack. Meantime, on the American public stage, she was becoming adored, if not fully understood. She was not an open book, but people wanted to turn the page. And when she went to India with her sister, Lee, and to Paris with her husband, Jack, ooh la la, she spoke perfect French, she conquered the city of lights and Charles de Gaulle with her flawless, flawless French, the president took it with his usual brio, saying about the trip, I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris, and I have enjoyed it. So, poets identified with President Kennedy are Frost, as I said, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep. Shakespeare's Henry V passage when the young king inspires soldiers on the eve of the Battle of Agincourt. We happy few, we band of brothers. And finally, Tennyson's Ulysses, which he first heard from his wife. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world, to sail beyond the sunset, to strive to seek, to find, and not to yield. Now we come to Dallas, autumn of 63. First, the Kennedys stayed in Fort, Ru Fort Worth. Mrs. Kennedy was running late that morning. And President Kennedy told the crowd, well, Mrs. Kennedy is organizing herself. It takes longer, but she looks better than we do when she does it. So. <laughs> <clears throat> The short hop to Dallas was not without danger. Adelaide Stevenson had been mugged by a mob four weeks earlier. Dallas was dangerous country. It was wild west, <clears throat> or south. It was a wild town with no place for Easterners, but Kennedy felt he had to win Texas in 1964. He was nonchalant about taking risks, remarking on the last day, his last day, that a man with a telescopic rifle could kill a president. And he always felt he would die young. At the parade, that's what happened. He was 46. With her husband's noonday murder in broad daylight, a woman of resolve and remarkable dignity reveals herself to a grief-stricken nation. Mrs. Kennedy tries to shield her husband's body from the shots. Mrs. Kennedy wears her blood-stained pink coat all the way back to Washington so people could see what was wrought. Time felt frozen in tears. Then the mother of two children, young children, widowed in a cruel instant, plans a state funeral to end all state funerals. World leaders came, citizens wept. Somehow she had the presence of mind in the darkness to reach for President Lincoln's funeral. That would be her model in the coming days, she told the Library of Congress. Look at what happened with Lincoln's funeral. That was her directive. The murdered 16th president, slain along with his dreams for the healing war, for healing the Civil War wounds. <clears throat> Had just glimpsed the victory of the Civil War when he was slain. Mrs. Lincoln, by the way, was so overcome that she did not attend her husband's funeral. Mrs. Kennedy conducted the entire national event complete with a riderless horse and solemn march, like her husband she went forth out in the open, marching along with Bobby Kennedy. The horse-drawn casket was a ritual echo of Lincoln's funeral, skipping stones on the river from the 1860s to the 1960s. 
one century. A White House advisor said, quote, we were supposed to be the tough ones, but this frail, frail girl turned out to have more strength than any one of us. Frail. Mrs. Kennedy further left a plaque in the Lincoln bedroom. In this room lived John F. Kennedy with his wife Jacqueline during the two years, 10 months, and two days. He was President of the United States. Indelible handwriting on the American story. You see what she's doing in a dire moment of time, in time, a national tragedy. Mrs. Kennedy is making a myth. Much like Mrs. Madison did in the sacking of Washington. Linking legacies to the greatest presidents Jefferson and Lincoln. Each lady, Dolly and Jackie, showed great, great, great grace under pressure. Grace under pressure. And amid calamity, bolstered and burnished their husband's legacy for the historical record. Finally, Mrs. Kennedy felt that Camelot might be a cheerier way to remember the brief shining moment of the Kennedy White House. The next year, she sat down for several interviews with the journalist Theodore White, and together they wove that connection to the legend of King Arthur and the Broadway musical. So that's why we played, well, my other talk, we played Camelot in the beginning. <laughs> so, um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.